My mom was a little bit peculiar about Halloween. She wasn't a superstitious person by nature, and no other holidays perturbed her. We celebrated Christmas and Easter and Thanksgiving without a problem. She took no issue with black cats or broken mirrors or spilled salt. She followed no religion, observed no rituals. It was really just Halloween that was the problem. She wasn't cruel about it or unfair. She let us celebrate when we were kids, let us pick our own costumes, took us out trick-or-treating, let us keep our candy, although we had to give up a few Reese cups each. She called them mom tags. But every year, a few days before Halloween, she sat us down on the living room couch and she asked, What's our rule for Halloween? And Ellen, my younger sister, and I would reply in tandem, Don't ever light a candle on Halloween night. But mom... I asked once, what about my jack-o'-lantern? We'll put a flashlight inside, she said firmly. No candles. But mom, said Ellen, just to be contrary, what if the power goes out and we don't have any flashlights? Can't we light a candle then? My mom glared at her in a way that said, don't push your luck, young lady. No candles. No exceptions. So that's how things went on Halloween. As I grew older, I learned to stop questioning her. She was, after all, an excellent mother. She just had this one unexplainable quirk. I figured, hey, I could live with that. And live with it, I did. Even after I moved out and graduated college, got a place of my own, my jack-o'-lanterns were always unlit, if I bothered to carve them at all. My friends would laugh when I would tell them our one Halloween rule growing up, but nobody ever gave me real grief about it. To be honest, I didn't really think about the candle again until after my mom had died and Ellen and I were fully established adults, living on our own and only seeing each other a few times a year. A few days after Halloween, I got a call from the Edmonton Police Department asking if I had seen Ellen. No, I haven't seen her in months. We spoke on the phone about a week ago. Is something wrong? She's been reported missing by a friend. Apparently she stopped showing up to work and nobody's been able to get a hold of her. We're just making the rounds to see if she's gone on a trip and forgot to mention it to anybody. I knew immediately something was terribly wrong. Ellen isn't the type of person to forget things like that. Of the two of us, she's always the most responsible and level-headed. As soon as I hung up the phone, I took off work and bought a plane ticket. Within 24 hours, I was standing outside her little two-story house, hoping against all hope that she'd be safe there. Alive. I found the fake hollow rock that held the spare key and let myself inside. Ellen? You here? You've got us all worried sick about you. I called out, ignoring the growing panic in my gut. Everything's okay. Ellen's fine. Nothing's happened. I repeated that over and over in my head, but I didn't believe it myself. I searched the house from top to bottom. All of Ellen's things were there. Wallet, keys, suitcase, luggage. She clearly hadn't intended to leave. If leaving's what she'd done. So what could have possibly happened? I felt sick to my stomach. I decided I'd drive down to the police station and talk to the officer in person. As I was walking out of the house, I noticed something I'd overlooked before. There was a jack-o'-lantern sitting on the porch, carved into a bat. I'm not sure why, but I felt compelled to take a closer look at it. Inside, the bottom of the pumpkin was full of candle wax, but there was no candle to be found. Months went by with no sign of Ellen. The police investigated, suspecting foul play may have been involved since she'd disappeared with none of her belongings. Eventually, however, they told me they were calling off the search. There's no evidence of foul play. She had no known enemies. There's no sign of forced entry at the house, said the officer, somewhat apologetic. We have to consider the possibility that, for whatever reason, she took it on herself to vanish. Start a new life. Sometimes people do these things. People you'd never expect. 
I didn't take that news very well. I cursed, I screamed, I took the story to the news, but everyone just shrugged their shoulders, shook their head, and moved on with their lives. But me? I kept thinking about that candle. It was stupid. Ridiculous. Just my mother's nonsense superstition, but desperate people will latch onto the most improbable things just to find answers. And I was certainly desperate. That's why, nearly one year later, I was letting myself into my sister's house once again. It was dusty, but I'd been paying the electricity and water bills to keep the place up and running for when she came back. Because I couldn't accept the possibility that she wasn't coming back. It was Halloween night, and I'd brought with me a long white candle and a pumpkin. It was stupid. A dumb theory that I was only clinging to because I had nothing left. That knowledge didn't stop me. I sat down, carved my pumpkin into a bat, just like hers. I put it on the porch where her pumpkin had sat last year and placed the candle inside. As soon as dusk hit, I lit the candle and then retreated into the house. I tried to imagine what she was doing that night after lighting the candle. Probably getting ready for trick-or-treaters. I wouldn't have any of those tonight as I'd left the porch lights off. So I sat there in my sister's living room, going through old photo albums and crying. It had to work. It wouldn't work. My mind tossed and turned, reflecting the turmoil in my soul. I was certain it would keep me awake all night. Nobody was more surprised than myself when I drifted off to sleep, sitting there in the living room couch, remembering my mother and wondering what she'd think of her daughters now. I woke up to a searing pain on my cheek. Fuck! I shouted, my hand coming up to my face. I blinked wildly, clearing the bleariness from my eyes. The room was dark. That's funny, I don't remember turning out the lights. Except for one burning candle. The candle that I'd left in the jack-o'-lantern outside. The candle was now floating in front of my face. The burning sensation was from a hot drip of wax splattering onto my cheek. I stared at the floating candle in disbelief. Am I dreaming? I wondered. The candle started to float away to the back door. Hey, wait! I called and then properly felt like an idiot for talking to a goddamn candle. The candle was waiting, for lack of a better term, at the back door for me. I reached out to open it and allow the candle and myself passage. To my surprise, the door didn't open out into the night air like it was supposed to. Instead, there was a long, stone passageway where my sister's backyard should have been. I followed behind the candle, straining to see in the dim light. The floor was covered in wax droppings, as though the candle, or its siblings, had made this trip often in the past. It felt strange on my bare feet. The topmost layer was still fresh. It was no longer hot, but warm and soft enough that it felt like walking on something living. There were things on the walls, too. Furrows and scratches in stone. Ugly stains where it looked like someone had tried to write or draw. I couldn't make anything out, though. Not with only the candle to light my way. I ignored the sick, squirmy feeling the faded symbols and scratches gave me as I walked on. It felt as though we walked an age before I saw the light up ahead. I ran ahead of my own candle to meet it, running out the end of the passageway and into what appeared to be a large room. Above my head, there were thousands of candles lighting the room, dripping wax like rain onto the floor. My candle floated up to join them as I stared in disbelief. I hissed as the wax fell on my skin. I tried to stumble back toward the passage to take shelter from the wax, but when I turned around, the door had been shut and locked. I was trapped. It's a terrible... Ugly feeling being caught in a trap that you don't understand. 
I was afraid of what I would find if I walked around the room getting a closer look at my surroundings, but I pushed it down ruthlessly. This is for Ellen, I thought. She's here. I know she's here. I have to find her. Turning back around, I ventured further into the room. The floor was covered in wax, several feet deep if I had to guess, and it was burning. The wax on top was fresh, and my feet sunk into its blistering heat. I cried out as I stepped forward, feeling the hot wax coating my feet to my ankle bone. The pain was making me nauseous. So was the smell. The room was permeating with an awful stink. It seemed out of place. It didn't smell like candle wax. It had to be coming from somewhere else, but where? The falling wax obscured my vision. I could do little but walk forward and hope for the best. By the time I found something, my skin was blistering and peeling, my hair was coated in wax, and my feet were in such horrible pain I could barely force myself forward. I was brought up short by towers of wax. They almost looked like bars of a cage, but for the fact that they weren't made of metal. At least not at first glance. Curious, I grabbed the wax bar, ignoring the pain, and started to pull it apart. My intuition was right. Underneath, I found the metal bars, a cage indeed. But I was at the top of it, the bars at my height, then covered with a roof of metal bars as well. I couldn't see the bottom of the bars. It was obscured by the wax that had built up over time. I couldn't see anything in the cage, nor could I discern a purpose for it. I shrugged and kept walking. Something was fluttering restlessly in the back of my mind. I was on the verge of understanding what was happening here. But there was something missing. I pushed on in hopes of finding it. I came to another cage, this one taller. I guess that the cages were the same size, and this one was sitting higher from the ground for some reason. Perhaps it had been placed here later than the other cage. It, too, was covered in wax. Just like the other, it didn't seem to hold anything. I continued on. I passed a few more cages of varying heights before I found an aberration. This cage was much, much taller than the others. I couldn't reach its top from where I was standing, and like the others, there was a large lump of wax resting against one side of the cage. I got as close as I could, put my hands through the bars, and started to pull off wax clumps. As I did, the horrible smell that saturated the air became even worse. I put one arm in front of my nose and mouth as I continued to dismantle the lump one-handed. Eventually, I pulled away something wet. Underneath, I saw black, sticky blood covering a thick white bone. I dropped my clump of wax and shoved back from the wax-covered body. Finally, I understood the purpose of the cages. I grabbed my mouth, forcing a scream back as I stumbled through the room. Finding more cages with bodies in varying states of death and decomposition... A few of them were sprawled out onto the floors of their cages, their arms reaching through the bars, begging for mercy. Some were covered in so thin a film of wax I could still see their open eyes, distorted and distended from the heat of the wax. I tried to force myself not to vomit. When I finally stumbled onto her cage, my heart leapt into my throat and stubbornly refused to budge. She wasn't dead. She was crawling through the wax, refusing to stop. Her body burnt, almost beyond recognition. As she crawled, she clawed the wax off herself at intervals. I could hear her breath heaving in and out of her. I shouldn't have been able to recognize her through the damage done to her skin, but somehow I knew. She wasn't dead. But this looked worse. 
I lurched over the cage and fell to my knees. Ellen? Ellen, is that you? It's me, Abigail. She looked up at me, her eyes still unmirrored by the falling wax, and she let out a horrible, keening noise. I knew I'd be hearing that awful sound in my nightmares for the rest of my life. I'm going to get you out of here. Don't worry. Everything is okay. I'll figure it out, I promise. I lifted my iron poker and swung it at the bars as hard as I could, over and over and over. But I wasn't strong enough. Or maybe the bars themselves were too strong. The lock. I looked down at Ellen, shocked that it was her who had spoken. Her voice was brittle and cracked like nothing I'd ever heard from her before. There's a padlock on the other side of the cage. There's a door. I got to my feet and hurried to the other side. Desperate, I began pulling at the wax until I found the large lump covering chains and lock. I cleaned it off as best I could, then I swung the poker at it. It took a few swings, but eventually the lock gave way. I fell to my knees once again and shoveled through the wax blocking the door from opening. Once I felt I'd cleared enough away, I began to pull on the door. It was impossible. I felt it in my guts as I strained. The hinges were full of wax. There was still so much wax blocking it from opening. There was no way I could get it to even budge. Hurry, Abby. Please, it's coming. What's coming? I asked. And then I heard it clanging noise, like chains being dragged behind a jailer. A surge of adrenaline went straight to my heart. All my strength went to my arms, and I stood there, and I pulled. It moved. By God, it moved just enough that Ellen was able to squeeze through the opening, aided along by the slippery wax still covering her body. She collapsed onto me, and I almost screamed at the heat of her wax-covered body. How on earth was she still alive? Would she still be alive when I got her out of this awful place? We have to go, now, she shrieked. And we went. Stumbling past the cages, back the way we came, I could only hope we were going in the right direction once we passed the final cage. We were walking blind, still surrounded on all sides by falling wax. The wax had begun to cover my skin, trapping the heat until it felt like I was roasting from the inside out. Finally, we stumbled into a wall, a wall without a door. It has to be here, I muttered, feeling along the wall. The rattling was getting louder. Whatever that thing was, it was getting closer. I placed my right hand along the wall, holding Ellen close to me with my left arm. We'll keep walking until we find it, I told her, staggering forward, feeling blindly for the exit. There's no time. She moaned. It's here. It's found us, and now we'll never escape. Before I could respond, the smooth stone gave way to wood. It's here, I shouted. I yanked at the door. Locked. I'd forgotten the door was locked. Ellen whispered. It's too late. Oh, God. Very, very slowly, I turned around. That thing was seven feet tall, at least, hunched over and draped in a red robe. Its arms were bony, blackened, like it had been charred. I couldn't tell if it were really made of bone or if it was covered in leathery skin. It was hard to tell through the chains and padlocks that had wrapped around one wrist. It stepped closer. Curiously, the wax didn't seem to touch it as it rained down before it hit the thing's figure. It vanished. That meant it was easier to see. I wish it hadn't been. It looked like a bloody candle standing there among the wax. I could feel it staring at me and was desperately glad that I couldn't yet see its face. I was sure that if I caught sight of it, I would go mad. It lifted its claw-like hand and pointed at me. No, 
I said as it stepped closer to us. With trembling arms, I gripped my poker in both hands and held it in front of me. You won't take us. Not without a fight. And then... Something curious happened. The beast, or wraith, whatever it was, reared back, stumbling in the wax as it held up a hand as though warding me off. What the hell? I said, taking an experimental step forward and brandishing my weapon. The thing stepped back again, emitting a grinding shriek that put nails on a chalkboard to shame. What is that? asked Ellen. It's just the iron poker from the fireplace, I said. A surge of hope filled me as I stepped back toward the door. I waved the poker over it and heard a clicking noise. Without any prompting, the door swung open into the passageway. Run! I screamed, grabbing Ellen and pulling her after me. I held the poker high to warn off anything that might follow. The beast didn't give chase. Instead, it let out a bellow, shaking the stone walls and nearly throwing us off our feet. It caused a sharp throbbing pain in my head and I thought for one insane moment that it had ruptured my eardrum. I saw the second door ahead of us. This one wasn't locked and we threw it open and stumbled out into Ellen's living room, collapsing onto the floor. I looked at Ellen. She looked back at me. And then without further prompting, both of us passed out. When we woke up in the morning, it was as though nothing had ever happened. Ellen wasn't burnt, covered in wax. She looked the same as I imagined she looked the night she disappeared. She was wearing pajamas and looked no worse for wear. My eardrums were fine, so was my skin. That horrible burning, peeling, and blistering had disappeared sometime during the night. How is this possible? I asked. She shook her head in disbelief. For one terrible, awful moment, I thought she wasn't real. That this was all some hideous nightmare and I'd wake up sisterless once more. But as we walked down to the morning sunlight and stumbled into my car, it gradually dawned on me that I'd done it. I'd found her. We piled into the car and headed to the hospital because we simply didn't know what else to do. And on the way, she began to laugh. Eventually, I joined in, and we laughed ourselves all the way to the ER door. Things were difficult for a while, though not quite so difficult as I'd anticipated. She told the doctors that she'd hit her head and forgotten everything. She'd only just remembered a few days ago and made her way back home to find me sitting on the living room sofa. I brought her into the hospital to make sure she was okay. The police showed up, of course. They didn't seem to believe her version of events, but they eventually accepted it. After all, she reappeared alive and unharmed. There was no evidence of criminal activity or wrongdoing. There was no reason to investigate any further. After that, I took Ellen home. As we walked inside the house, I saw that the candle had disappeared from inside my pumpkin. And now I knew where it had gone. We didn't talk very much about what happened in that horrible place. She understandably didn't want to relive it once she had escaped, but there was one thing I had to ask her. As we sat at the kitchen table that morning, I said, How did you live an entire year in there? All the others I saw were dead. How are you still alive? Dead? She said, staring at me. No, you don't understand. Nobody in there is dead. Some people simply gave up. The wax builds up, melts off their skin, reduces them to bone and viscera for eternity. But none of them can die. Death doesn't exist in that place. I guess, for that matter, life doesn't either. Not the kind of life we understand anyway. I knew if I stopped crawling, if I gave up, I'd just be trapped in the wax like the others. I couldn't do that. Anything was better than that. That was years ago now. 
To this day, I don't understand what happened in that awful place. I don't know how lighting a candle opens the door on Halloween night or why it doesn't open the door for everyone. I don't know why nobody who enters there dies or why we left that place miraculously unharmed. I don't know how that poker was able to ward off the disgusting creature that would have sentenced me to the same fate as Ellen. All I do know is that as soon as I got back home, I threw out every single candle in the house. Halloween or not, I'll never light another candle again. You ever had an itch you can't scratch? I once watched a documentary about people who had lost limbs but still had itches in places that no longer existed. From what I saw, it slowly drove them crazy because it was all in their head. I sympathize, but my problem's a bit worse than that. Try as I might, I can't scratch memories, and I certainly can't squash the bugs that have gotten in them. I first noticed the original instinct when I was talking about an old story with friends. We were out for a drink at a bar, and a strange spike-shelled bug about the size of a dime began crawling across the table between us. Wait, no, that's not how it happened. They're in my memories, you see. That bug is skittering throughout my memory of the bar now. It wasn't there the first time. I know because I wrote it down. I trust my writing. No. The first bug I noticed was in a story I was recounting at the bar. I was talking about a concert I'd gone to about six years before, and I began describing a horrifying little bug that had crawled over my hand while I sat in the grass. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen, and... I went on and on describing it. My friend had been there, but he didn't remember the incident. Another friend confirmed. That led me to the strange notion that I was remembering events incorrectly. But I could see the bug. As much as it made me shudder, I focused my inner awareness upon the memory and I watched it wander around the grass. Was I remembering it differently from moment to moment? It had a dark blue shell with tiny spines. The sight of it triggered innate disgust and revulsion, but I couldn't control the me in my memory and jump away. Whenever I did try to move away, the bug vanished from sight, because I was really just imagining the motion. Active change brought me out of the memory and into imagination. For that first week, most of my mental time was spent watching that bug. As I sat at work or in the car on the commute, I was only half present for my other half was at the concert six years ago, watching a horrifying bug crawl upon oblivious friends and strangers. They were just memories clapping along to the music or drinking beers in clear plastic cups, but it still made me shudder to watch it crawl up their arms or around their faces. At one point, it fell into a sloshing beer and got trapped trying to move its repulsive little legs fruitlessly back and forth in the amber froth, and I thought my troubles were over. I called up that friend and asked if he remembered a weird bug falling into his beer at that concert. He said that he did, yeah, man, at least I think. When was that again? Six years ago? Yeah, I think I do remember that. He didn't seem convinced and I began reading up on how memories are formed. Apparently, memory is very untrustworthy, and people form false interpretations of events all the time based on prompts and a little unconscious imagination. Did he really remember the bug in his beer, or had I prompted him to envision something that had never happened? Of course, I had other things to worry about at the time, so I let it go for a bit. Instead of staring at the bug at the concert six years before, I spent my nights staring at the divorce papers on my kitchen table. In some ways, my empty apartment was like the palace of memory I'd been reading about. Every object and corner held some mental tag to a previous event, now soured and full of lies. The second time it happened, I was sitting at that table staring at a particular paper cup that had been left out for several months. Like the concert, it was another memory of her. 
We were at a coffee shop doing nothing in particular when a smaller bug began crawling up her cup. It was not the same bug from before, but it was dark blue, spined, and clearly the same species. She just kept smiling. Did she not see the horrifying thing moving down her fingers and along the back of her hand? This time, instead of being captivated by the insect, I tried not to think about that coffee shop. If I just didn't go near that memory, then everything would be alright. But no. I could feel a festering outside the edges of my awareness, and next time I looked, once I finally couldn't help it anymore, I also saw a number of small dots along the side of the coffee cup. I watched them day in and day out until they grew larger, and then I knew. They were eggs. I continued going to social events and nodding along to conversations as my friends talked around me, but I couldn't really hear them. All I could think about was the disgusting horror growing in my mind. What would happen when those eggs hatched? How had the smaller bug gotten to a different memory from the concert? At times, someone would ask me if I was alright, but I just smiled and claimed that I was. How would I tell them that my brain was becoming infested? Books, articles, online research. You know what's amazing? Lucid dreaming actually worked for a little while. Each night, I practiced keeping my awareness as I sank into dreams. There, the fusion of imagination and memory allowed me to act for the first time, and I rushed forward, slapped the bug off her hand, and stomped the coffee cup and its dime-sized black eggs. But when I woke up, I'd found that I'd just worsened the problem. I'd created a new memory of the coffee shop, the slapping and the stomping, but the original memory still existed. Try as I might, I could never alter the original memory, and... On the fifth successful lucid dreaming attempt, I missed a few of the eggs and found that I'd just created more. I was no longer staring at divorce papers on the kitchen table. Now, those were buried under piles of bills. I'd pay them eventually. I still went to work and sat through my day. I had money, I just really needed to deal with this infection of the mind first. After I paid the bills, I'd shower, too. And as I feared, they began wandering into other memories. A woman approached me at the bar before my friends arrived, but all I could think about was how any memories I created with her would just be infested sooner rather than later. What's a pretty face with bugs crawling on it? At home, in the car, at work, out with friends, I was near to screaming every moment of every day. Two bugs, six bugs, ten, fifty bugs, a hundred, a thousand, crawling along every moment of the last six years of my life. Worse, they were starting to crawl on me, and I could feel their horrible little legs as itching on my skin. Scratching my real arms didn't help. The itch was on remembered skin, for the bugs were on remembered limbs. Friends asked about my nervous itching and now visible tension, but I just kept smiling and saying that I was alright. There was no way to share this problem. They'd never believe me. They'd never understand. So I stopped going out with them. The itching began small, but grew too maddening over the course of time. Scratching did nothing, even if I scraped down to lower layers of my skin. I turned to online research again, and I read about reflection therapy. Those who had lost a limb and had itches there could assuage it by using a mirror to simulate the missing area while scratching at the real one. It was all in the mind, they said. Real mirrors wouldn't work for me, because the itch was not on a physical spot lost. What would work? At home, and itching in the dark among piles of discarded fast food bags, I began envisioning an imagined version of me. He was happy, successful, loved. Life was good for him. 
brush the bugs off of me, I told him. And he came close and began slapping them away and stomping on their overturned and scrambling forms. And for a moment it worked. But then the bugs covered him too and nickel and dimed his flesh until he was just bones. He screamed while it happened, but only in that half-hearted, hollow-sensed, that imagined sound holds. Traumatized, demoralized, I kept doing research, kept telling myself I would beat this, that bugs in my memory had to have a vulnerability. If I began with the assumption that they were real, then they were creatures of the mental plane somehow. What connected them to my physical self? What was consciousness? Scratching open sores constantly, stinking in the high heaven, and constantly muttering to myself, I knew I was at my wit's end. I could see it. I could see myself. In the mirror, the bugs were crawling upon my skin openly. It was awareness. It was thought. It's all in the mind, they'd said. That's what this note is about. I've crafted a careful plan, done my research, and mapped out as much as I could, but I'm still not quite aware of the danger. I want you to know that I'm not insane and that it's not your fault. I also wanted on the record that my friends had nothing to do with this. I stole the knives and drills without their knowledge. I've sanitized everything and set up as sterile an operation room as I can. I'm not crazy. This is really happening, and it's the only way. I already know I'm right because I've made one drill hole and the bugs are beginning to spill out all over the floor and skitter away. I have to complete this surgery. Because it's all in my head. Up until last December, I'd worked for over 10 years in disability benefits compliance. My job was, essentially, periodically, checking in on people around our region who were receiving state disability benefits to make sure that they were being honest about their disability. They were complying with medical recommendations to mitigate or treat the disability, and that there were no other irregularities with regards to their care or the benefits they received. Usually, the in-house visits were fairly short. Most of the real information was coming from forms filled out by their treating doctors and a review of their current medical records, as you can't rely on self-reporting when it comes to these things. Still, occasionally, you would find someone who needed more help than they were getting or that you could prove was being dishonest just to get free money. It wasn't exactly a fun job, but I at least felt like I was performing a necessary, if boring, bureaucratic task. In the past few years, we've started having to assess cases where the disability claim doesn't fall into the traditional categories of physical or mental issues that we've had since I started the job over a decade ago. Rather, the qualifying mental disability category has been expanded to include moderate to severe mood disorders and severe phobias if verified by a psychologist or psychiatrist. I'm not the final say on whether these people are truly disabled or not, but when I hear that the biggest problem they have is that they won't go outside, I admit to being skeptical. My last visit in October of 2018, Jerry Rhodes had that very problem. They call it agoraphobia, and I know there's more nuance to it than what I'm saying, but it boiled down to the fact that, except under very rare circumstances, such as a medical emergency, Mr. Rhodes had not left his home in five years. I was surprised when I first met him. I'm not sure what I was expecting, but it wasn't the friendly, outgoing man who greeted me at the front door and brought me into a clean and cozy living room. I commented on how nice everything was being kept, especially by a man living alone in his early 30s, and he just laughed and nodded. Told me that since he stayed here all the time, he tried his best to make sure it was a good place to stay. Over the next 30 minutes, I conducted our standard interview. 
diagnosis, treatment, activities of daily living, therapeutic routines, outlier behaviors, difficulties and concerns, and finally, satisfaction with benefit services. He answered all the questions cheerfully enough, and while I appreciated his cooperation and even found myself liking him as we talked, I couldn't get past the fact that he seemed so... normal. He didn't seem afraid. He didn't seem anxious. He didn't seem like anything was wrong. In fact, the only thing that I noticed was that he kept looking at his watch. He'd wanted to meet earlier in the day, but I'd had to push it back to the last minute. Maybe I was keeping him from something. Still, I found my curiosity getting the better of me. I didn't think he was necessarily lying about having this phobia, but I did wonder if he was getting over it more than he had let on. Or if he really was as bad off as the reports had said, had he always been that way. It wasn't one of my standard questions, and I could tell he was getting antsy as it got later in the afternoon, but I pushed ahead into one last topic. Do you know where your phobia came from? Jerry had been glancing out the window, and when he looked back to me, I could see the first signs of true nervousness there. Giving an uneven laugh, he shrugged. <laughs> Where does any phobia come from? I guess I just have bad wiring. He gave a slight shrug before continuing. Do you have any other questions? Because it's getting late and I'd hate to see you getting home in the dark. The man was watching me intently now, his tongue darting out quickly before disappearing again between his thin lips. I understand, and I appreciate it, but... Back to my earlier question. What I mean is, were you always afraid of situations outside your home? And if it developed later, can you point to something that caused it, or did it just come to you over time? He looked out the window again briefly before letting out a deflated sigh. Not meeting my eyes, he sunk back into his chair. No. Not always. Something happened, or I remember something happening, though the doctors say it's not true. That it's just my mind coping with the trauma of losing three of my childhood friends. I felt my eyes widen slightly in surprise. You lost three of your friends when you were younger, or more recently. Jerry didn't look at me now, his voice leaden. Oh, no, when I was young. Eleven. I lost all three of them the same night, though others would disagree about that too. I didn't understand what he was talking about, but I was interested. Besides, I only had access to his records for the last five years, but there had been no mention of delusions or schizophrenia. If this was a sign of some new issue, I needed to document it so he could get help. Jerry, do you mind telling me about it? He just stared at me for a moment before shaking his head. You won't believe me. And it would take too long. It's getting dark. You need to go. I debated internally. I wasn't trying to be rude or stress him out, but I didn't want to leave without at least trying to find out more about what was going on with him. Jerry, I'm just trying to get the best picture I can. I'm not here to judge, but if I don't get all the information I need, it could affect your benefits negatively. Seeing his deepening frown, I held up my hands. Not trying to pressure you, just encourage you. I want to understand what you're talking about, that's all. I won't judge you or what you tell me, okay? Seeing him looking at his watch again, I added, and this is my last question. If you tell me what happened to you and your friends, I'll go right after. Scout's honor. The man stared at me for several seconds before giving a defeated shrug. <sighs> Fine. If you want to hear it so much, I'll tell you. Then you'll think I'm crazier than you already do. When I was 11 years old, 
I went trick-or-treating the day before Halloween with my best friends, Matt, his brother Gary, and their cousin Jessica, who, funnily enough, lived to the next town over in Jessica's Resolve. We all gathered up at my house at 6 o'clock and turned loose on our own with the strict provision that we were to go no further south than Green Street or further west than Harleston Avenue. We were pretty good kids, and we looked down for each other. Our parents knew the most trouble we were apt to get into was eating too much candy on the way back home. And things went great at first. We had all put effort into our costumes that year, and it showed. Matt was a skeleton, Gary was a ninja, Jessica was a fairy with gossamer wings, and she could make them move a little when she wiggled her shoulders. I went as an executioner, complete with a black hood my mom handmade with me, and a big plastic headsman axe I'd gotten from the dollar store. The area we planned to cover was large, but it was also dense. There were three good-sized neighborhoods, plus a few side streets and dead-end roads that had more houses to try. At first, we were regularly running across other groups of kids doing the same things we were, but by eight, that number had dwindled. We were far from my house, and pushing the limits of being able to get back by our nine o'clock deadline. But our thought was that this area would be less picked over, too. Lots of kids didn't go out this far, despite the fact that there were some big houses tucked back on the smaller roads, and big houses, in our expert opinions, meant better candy. For a while, our plan seemed to work. No one else was out anymore, and the houses that answered the door were giving out the good stuff. Two more roads, and we'd be done with the best haul we'd ever managed. That's when we saw the other group of trick-or-treaters. At first, we just noticed another group of kids traveling in our wake. We'd leave a house, and if we looked back, we'd see them hitting the same place a few minutes later. And yeah, there were four of them, just like us, but we weren't missing out on anything because we always got candy first. But as we made our way to the end of one road and cut over toward the next, Jessica pointed out that they were gaining on us. It was said as kind of a joke, but we all heard the nervousness in her voice. We weren't babies, but walking around at night on Halloween was still kind of spooky. The fun kind of spooky where you made dumb jokes and you were glad your friends were with you, but... (sighs) But when she said, they're gaining on us, guys, her voice was different. It had picked up a thread of less fun, nastier fear. And we all recognized it because we were feeling it ourselves. We picked up our own pace as we turned onto Everling Road. No one said it aloud, but as a group, we decided to try and avoid these other children if we could. When we went past the first house without stopping, no one, not even Gary, complained. We were ready to get home. They could have the rest of the candy. I was the one who looked back and saw the group behind us even closer now. They were passing by a well-lit and decorated house, and in that light and lesser distance I could see more detail than I had before. I looked where I was going for a second, and then turned back for another look. No. I had been right the first time. Shit. They're wearing the same costumes we are. A palpable tension began to grow between the four of us. No one said anything for a minute, but as we were reaching the other end of the road, Matt glanced back. He pulled up his skeleton mask when he turned around, and I could see he was scared. Fuck. They are. They look like us. They they fucking look like us. We made the corner in unison, all walking so fast it was almost a jog, our plastic bags filled with candy, smacking our legs with a rhythm that matched the pounding of our hearts. Gary and Jessica glanced back again, and it was Jessica who finally asked the question we'd all been pondering for the last several minutes. What do we do? Gary shrugged, the casual gesture not matching the troubled look in his eyes. We just ignore them. 
It's probably just dumb luck or someone trying to scare us for Halloween. He paused and then added, But, uh, we should go on home anyway. Not give them any more fun. Matt was already shaking his head. I don't think so. Who do we know that knows what we were going as and would do this? Something's wrong with this. We need to get help. Jessica glanced back again and sucked in a breath at what she saw. They're getting really close. I... There's no help out here. We don't know these people and those kids haven't done anything yet. We just need to get back to Jerry's house right now. Fast. I looked over at her, trying to keep my voice low enough not to be heard by our pursuers. Are you saying we should make a run for it? She went to answer when Gary cut in, his voice high and panicked. He looked back again. Oh, God. God, Jess, it looks like you. We all turned around then, and he was right. While the other three had their faces covered with masks or hood, the fairy's face was largely visible beneath dramatic makeup. This close. It wasn't just someone copying Jessica's costume. It had her face, too. We all broke off running, and at first we stayed together, but then Matt fell, and Gary stopped to pick him up. Jessica and I would have stopped, too, but there was no time. The other group was running now, almost catching Matt and Gary before they got back going and cut down a side street. The doubles split as well, and now me and Jessica were being hunted by just the fairy and the executioner. I... I lost Jessica on the way home. I'd like to say it was a mistake or a, an accident. And I guess it was in the sense that I didn't want to leave her. But I was real fast as a kid. Fastest kid in our class. When I looked back one last time and saw them gaining, I yelled for Jessica to come on and I'd let go of her hand. I told myself she'd catch up, that I was just going to go ahead and get the door open. We were less than a hundred yards from my house by then. Everything would be okay. I just needed to get home. I made it there safely. And when I opened the door and looked back, no one was following me anymore. No executioner, no Jessica, no one. I ran into where my parents were watching a movie, hysterical, and I started telling them what had happened. It took a few minutes for them to get what I was saying and realize that I was serious, and that's when they called Mike and Gary's parents. Had they seen the other children? The tone of the conversation was first fear and worry, but that changed within just a few seconds. My father pulled the receiver away to give me a half-irritated, half-amused look. They're fine. They all just came in over there. I wanted to feel relief, but I didn't. The next day at school, none of them were there, and when they came back the following week, they were all different. I tried to tell myself I was being silly or that maybe they were pissed at me because I'd left them or they were scared about it and didn't want to talk to me and be reminded of it, but I didn't really believe any of that because they were all different. Not just because they ignored me now and barely responded when I tried to approach them, but look. This sounds dumb, but they didn't move right anymore. They didn't smell right. Everything about them was off, but when I tried to tell my mom that one time, she just gave me a patronizing hug and said that she was sure they'd come around and start being friends with me again soon. Two months later, they were all pulled from school. 
I hated to admit it, but it was almost a relief. I'd already made sure to avoid them outside of school, and not having to worry as much about them catching me between classes or on their way home made my life a bit easier, especially when I got my parents to start picking me up from school like they had when I was younger. I never heard why they left, and while I'm sure my parents talked about it, they did so discreetly. I think back then they still thought it was just All about their son having a falling out with his little friends. And then, three years later, Jessica murdered her little brother and committed suicide. It was big news in Jessica's resolve and empire for a while, but like everything, it faded with time. Four years later... When word got around that Matt and Gary had recently disappeared after years of mental issues, it was little more than trivia for most. When they were killed in a police raid six years ago in Indiana, they had four women in their basement. All of them had been raped, tortured, and murdered. It didn't even make the local paper. I've kept track of them all this time, carried the guilt of what happened to me, and yes, it was traumatic, but to answer your original question, my agoraphobia just started five years ago. Because that's when they first came back for me. Jerry broke off talking as he looked out the window. He visibly paled as he stood up. You need to go now. It's dark. They'll be here soon. Walking closer to the window, he put his hand to his mouth as he looked back at me. He looked terrified. Jesus, they're already out there. It's too late. You have to just stay here until morning. I'm I'm so sorry. It was my turn to feel afraid. There was no way I was staying overnight with this delusional man. Grabbing my purse, I headed for the front door. Sorry, Mr. Rhodes, but I have to be getting home. I saw he was moving to stop me, and I yanked the front door open and rushed through it before he got the chance. I half expected him to grab me from behind, but instead I felt a whoosh of air as the door slammed shut behind me. Through the door I heard Jerry, his voice high and trembling. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. It was then that I first realized I wasn't alone. Standing at the bottom of the porch steps were four small figures, all dressed up for Halloween even though it was several days away. A skeleton, a ninja, a princess, and an executioner. I wanted to turn around and knock on the door, ask Jerry to let me back in, but no. This was some prank, or I I didn't know what, but I needed to act rationally about it. Forcing a smile, I tried to keep my voice light as I stepped toward the front of the porch. Hey kids, out for some early... Send Jerry out. The words froze in my throat. That voice didn't sound like a child. I wasn't sure what it sounded like. Other than it didn't sound like a little boy or a girl, and it made my stomach clench so hard I gasped. Swallowing, I made myself try again. Kids, I think Mr. Ro- Send Jerry out. I felt my vision swim this time, and I had a panicked moment where I thought I might actually fall. If I fall, they'll be on me, and... No, I, I had to keep... That's when they began walking up the steps. I leapt off the porch and ran to my car, never looking back, never stopping until I was across town and home behind a locked door. I spent the rest of the night looking out my windows, but I never saw anything out of the ordinary. Two months later, I saw in the newspaper that Jerry Rhodes had disappeared. 
It worried me at the time, but I tried to chalk it up to his mental issues. Maybe he had finally run off somewhere else, and wherever it was, I hoped he got some peace. Whatever it was, I'm done with him and whatever he was caught up in. That was the important part. The next morning, I found a note posted on my front door in a red, childlike scrawl. It wasn't signed, but I knew who it was from, and I knew what it meant. I quit my job that week, and by the end of the month, I'd moved across the country. I've spent the last few months dreading the anniversary of the day I met Jerry Rhodes and the things that stalked him, and I should be safe here. No one from Empire even knows where I'm at. But last night, when I looked out on my lawn, I saw four small silhouettes outlined in the moonlight. They stood there all night, silent and waiting. I didn't know how it worked for Jerry, how often they came, why they couldn't get him sooner, and what mistake he finally made. But I do know that they're patient, and that they keep their word. Because I still have the note I found that morning, just a couple of days after Jerry finally lost his siege. Its message was simple, both a promise and a threat, just one single line, the color of faded blood. See you next October.